You're listening to the Podcast Detroit Network. Visit www.podcastdetroit.com for more information. Friends, welcome back to Storyteller Conclave. I'm Sarah. And I'm Rob. And uh, we are a podcast about uh, how to run your best uh, tabletop role playing game. We are system agnostic. So if you're tuning in for D&D stuff or you're turning in for 7th C, Shadowrun, doesn't matter. We're going to be discussing all sorts of topics. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about NPCs. Yes. Uh, the thing that uh, most people forget that are really there that the storyteller is required to have. It's what makes the world live around the game. And today we actually have a special guest joining us as well. Uh, we have Chris Rummel, one of our uh, dear friends, who is also a uh, masterful storyteller with, I will honestly say it, decades of experience. And uh, But before we get into uh, bringing him in and uh, – Starting off with our, our talking points, let's get a little bit of news done here. Announcements, announcements, announcements. Oh, yes. That is a terrible way to die. So we've got our Patreon uh, that should be up next week. Um, we're working on some uh, different options for it. Uh, but as soon as the RSS feed gets completed, we'll be putting that together uh, so that you'll be able to see it. We're also looking at possibly doing a merchandise page to help us out as well. So uh, – if people want to donate to the show and give us a hand uh, at paying for this as we uh, continue through the process, uh, we will have that as well. Yeah, great, little, great little ways to support the show so we can continue making these uh, these great uh, great episodes for you. Um, also, our RSS feed. Um, this is our third episode. And yes. we have it on good authority that uh, three episodes is what it takes to get published out onto the major syndication networks and such like that. So we should have our RSS feed uh, up. Uh, sometime relatively soon. Uh, check out on uh, – we'll, we'll be announcing it on Discord and Twitter uh, as well. You can find us on Twitter at ST underscore Conclave and uh, you can find our Discord link pinned on our uh, Twitter as well. So check us out there, twitter.com slash ST underscore Conclave. So should we get into this thing, this crazy, crazy world? NPCs are a huge topic, and I think the sooner we get started, the better. So uh, again, introducing our friend uh, friend of the show, Chris Rommel. How are you today, Chris? Great, great. Hello, everyone. All right. Well, we, we have a lot to go through here, and uh, we've kind of incorporated in some uh, uh, questions that we've gotten on the yeah. Discord from doing some a little differently this time, stuff like that. So a uh, big discussion here. So let's let's. I mean, just start talking briefly about what what exactly is an NPC. Like when I think about NPCs, I think of characters who are guides. I think of your typical, you know, uh, tavern owner. You know, it, it's a trope to say that, you know, you walk into a tavern and there's the tavern owner and they have a certain look and a certain feel about them. There's always certain people. There's the bard in the corner. Like these are your your cast members who sit around your players mm-hmm. who – help tell the story and they are often very tropey you know they're the the yoda or the villain or something like that uh but there's more to them than just this facade there's a a craft that has to be done around them to make them more than just a fixture or more than just something thin in the story itself um and i know that we've got this idea in our head of how deep they can go but sometimes we get the questions of people of you know well how deep do you go with it how much do you do how much so i think a start point is just kind of getting the basic characteristics of what an npc is and i know to me it there's a lot of flavor that goes into that and uh i think what we can talk about a little is where do we start like do we start with a trope or do we start with a use so like when I'm thinking of what are the characteristics when we first think of an NPC, what is the basic things that we think about? Sure, absolutely. Chris, you got thoughts? Well, to me, OK. So an NPC is any entity that is not a player character. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times you get to decide that as the GM. OK, so we're having a tavern. So I've got an NPC bartender, an NPC waiter, an NPC door bouncer, 
and an NPC group at the table. But there's a lot of things that say you're playing in a vampire campaign and one of your characters has animalism. Now your NPCs are like a mouse that happens to have been in the room or, <laughs> you know, whatever, uh, the, the local guard dog at the, at the junkyard. You know, the things that you maybe didn't plan ahead for, but any, literally any entity that is not a player, right? You, you could have an NPC that's a computer or an NPC that's a, you know, some, a talking sword could mm-hmm. be an NPC, right? Yep. So all, all that stuff is fair game. And mm-hmm. I think where you start from is essentially A, what you need for the story and then B, where the character interest lies, right? Because again, a lot of characters will decide what NPCs they're interacting with. However much groundwork you put into building out particular NPCs, players will decide like, hey, that mysterious guy that just walked by us, hold on, I'm going to go talk to him. Right, like, right. OK. These are – these are some of these people are just extras in a movie set. Right. And now the player characters have decided that this guy is in fact – has a speaking role. Right. And, and they're very curious about him. So, yeah. So that actually leads, leads really great into our next question then. Uh, so – you never know who the PCs are going to latch on to. You don't you never know who they're going to approach, who they're going to make important just by their own actions and attentions and stuff like that. Right. So for for you as a storyteller, how in depth do you get in your write ups? Um do you, you know, keep elaborate notes on everybody they, they may come across or are are they just the barest sketches or you know, what's what's your process on that? I think for me, I try to Start by dealing with the ones that are the the most important to the story. Like if I know in this section of the story there are people who are going to be talking with somebody, I need to know their motivations. I need to kind of know their how they're going to be seen, how they're going to be felt to the players. So I'll do write-ups for those, but I'll always know who's in the room, like who those background people are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, But I know that uh, there's always other pieces and I know in a previous discussion we had – uh, Chris, you had gone into uh, what you kind of felt as like the 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 base things that any NPC should have, like what kind of uh, that that image or uh, or I guess description is the way you put it. But I think it's a bit more than that that gives them that kind of that color and flavor. So what I look for when I'm establishing an NPC, number one is what the what the players will see. So the outside veneer of what what is obvious from the environment. What's actually going on, right? So if, if the, if the, let's say the bum that's in the alleyway is actually an undercover police detective, right? So there's two different things happening there. One the players see and one that's actually going on. And then the other thing is what's the motivation for that particular character? If you know those three things, then you know everything you need to know as far as what that character is going to do, how that interaction is going to go and what point it has in the story. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention beforehand, a, a real like, Probably the most useful tool for uh, creating NPCs in general uh, is there's a – essentially we're communicating, right? The, our goal as GMs is to communicate to the players what is happening at any given time and NPCs are just a tool to do that. Right. And scenes are just a tool to do that. Locations are a tool to do that, so on and so forth. And one thing that always works in that communication is tropes, right? right. So you have – the, the tough guy with the big ugly scar on his face. OK. The player characters know that guy can fight. They just know that intrinsically by looking at him. Right. You don't mm-hmm. have to say like he won 100 battles and this and another thing, right? So uh, there's a site, uh, tvtropes.org, where they essentially have mm-hmm. this sort of shorthand communication for people that have been raised by pop culture. <laughs> and and that's amazing, amazing helpful tools for for putting together NPCs. So you grab a couple of those. Decide what look what the character looks like on the outside, what's going on the inside, and what their motivation is, and that's all you need for any NPC in any situation. It takes a minute. Yeah, I mean, it's like you had brought up, like you know, when you walk into a room and, or walk into a, a town, and every you know you, the general population looks dull, everything feels gray. You know, people are thin. You know, there's lots of beggars. The the merchants are very ho- close, holding all of their things. But then you see this fine gentleman with rings and jeweled necklace and and he has a a standard bearer behind him and a collar in front of him saying mm-hmm. that you know the the duke is approaching you know that guy is a rich motherfucker you know without yeah, yeah, a question yeah, yeah. just by the trope of who he is and he's fat and he's obviously milking the county for what it's worth right right uh, I want to I want to actually pipe in a little bit on the TV tropes thing too because uh, I've I've used that site uh, not probably not as much as I should 
Uh, but what I really like about it is when you do go to one of these tropes, you know, like the tough guy trope or whatever, whatever it's named, and they, they've all got names and they're all linked and they've all got their own pages. But they'll start describing those particular tropes and they'll say things like, you know, the tough guy trope is often played with the, you know, alongside the femme fatale trope and the this trope, you know, or sometimes in other stories that involve these elements, they might be used in, uh, you know, in line with this trope or that trope. And those are wonderful jumping off points for like inserting your, uh, you know, flushing out your story and stuff like that. Because you may not have thought like, oh, pair this guy up with a femme fatale, but you've got the big brutish Scarface guy, and now you've got this slender femme fatale standing right next to him, and you're like, oh, what's her story? You know, now maybe this guy's her bodyguard, and now you've got you. You went right. from I'm just going to put a tough guy in there to like now kind of got the roots of a story so right, uh, right really great resource i would i would definitely check it out this tv tropes.org yeah and i guess that kind of brings it in because the first thing that came into my mind about this was some of the the original stories that like i've played with you like one of the things that chris uh uh brought me into was the world of Shadowrun, and mm-hmm. i love the richness i love the color that it has just as a setting and one of the questions that we got from our community was uh, do you frequently use PCs as plot guides or do you find that cheap? So like in uh, in Shadowrun, one of the main characters that effectively is your plot giver is, is a Johnson. Is Mr. Johnson, yeah. He's, he's the guy who sits in the bar and they come in all kinds of flavors and mm-hmm. styles. Even though you always know what he's there for, he's giving you the job. There's so much you can do with that. But I guess in using this question a little bit, do you find that using PCs as plot guides – can be cheap. And and I, I think we need to kind of define what a plot guide is. Right. I, I when I when I read this question, uh, my initial thought was uh you know, I, I think the intent of the question was that, you know, old man walks into the bar and says, oh, you look like adventuring sorts. Right. Here's a quest. You have to go slay this dragon and there's treasure in it for you. You know, very, very rote and form sort of classic D&D, almost, you know, World of Warcraft style. Right, right. Um, but I would submit to you that just anybody who has a problem that the PCs take interest in is a plot guide. Sure, sure. Um, anybody who says, you know, gee, it would be great if we had more of these magic stones so that we could open up the magic portal to the other plane. But, oh, we don't. Uh, we have to find those things out in those ruins. Oh, gosh darn it. Right. I mean, I think that's guidey to a degree, but at the same time, it's just life. But it's, it's a plot hook. I think right. anybody who throws out a plot hook can, can kind of be a, a plot guide for you. Right. Yeah. To me, I read this to mean essentially, you know, the exposition character, the guy right. who is in the movie that knows way more than he should, is in the right place at the right time. And you're like, yep. oh, yeah, I did see those guys through here earlier. They mentioned something about a magic sword. I think they were going to a cave on the other side of the mountain over there. There's supposed to be some kind of mercenary base or something like that? They're, how does this guy know any of that? Wow, thank right. you, bartender who, uh, who remembered an oddly specific bit of conversation from three days ago about three guys in his bar that's probably crowded at all times. Exactly. It just happens exactly. to have a map <laughs> so, yeah. and everything so, else yeah. you need. So that's a little cheap. And, and one of the things I do to avoid that is I don't let any of the NPCs in the game have any information that they wouldn't be allowed to have without naturally having that flow of information, right? So I've had players shake down NPCs. I've had players torture NPCs <laughs> for information they just can't possibly – like, I would love to help you. You have set me on fire. I don't know the answer to this, right? right? And that's a, that's a thing, whereas there are characters, you know, who do know and may or may not share that information, mm-hmm. right? So so just a straight-up character who's giving plot hooks and, and exposition and whatnot, yeah, that that can definitely be cheap. Unless that's the sort of campaign you're going for, if if the campaign itself is is that sort of you know light and fun sort of thing where that that's what the characters are looking for, yeah, then sure, that's completely allowed. That's what I was going to say. Is it really also depends on the tone of your campaign. So if you are doing something completely tropey and campy, or yeah. you know if you're doing like a pulp sort of thing, you may have that you know old wizened master who knows everything about everything at any given time. You know, right, right, has that amazing pinpoint insight. You know. Yeah, and and like for me, like the first – like we had talked about this before and kind of gone through things. I got an image in my mind of things, but literally in this discussion, I, I could think of the scene from Firefly 
where the players have two, you know, where the effectively the players, the characters mm-hmm. have two NPCs. One is this brutish guard, you know, of of this uh, of of, a, of one of the villains, and he's just like he's gonna come after you with everything. He doesn't give up. He oh. doesn't care about the money. He doesn't. And they just kick him into the turbo fan, like literally yep. murdering him. Right. They look to the other guy. They're just like, take the money. He's like, you know, that's a great yep. idea. Right. I'm gonna Got take it. it. I'm gonna go right. Back. This is a better deal for both of us. <laughs> yep. Like, and that's the whole thing is that yeah, that guy was the exposition guy. But the other guy, he's just a dude. He's not going to be like, you know, he, he was right. They're going to come hunting for you. No, he's he's got a purpose. Right, he knows right, who right, he right. is. And I, I think that kind of puts us uh, into that question of, of you know, are – do NPCs become more than they're intended? Like mm-hmm. how Absolutely. do you move that? I, Absolutely. Um, I was remembering uh, in our discussion uh, yesterday, you were talking, Chris, about your NPCs who literally dragged a character through – and you ended up having to use that NPC and do more with them as they drug this NPC through the game. Well, there's – so there's a several instances of that. Like uh, Shadowrun is great for that because, again, player characters will leech onto whatever sort of hook they think is there, whether it's there or not. So you have somebody, say, set up in in a place – that is like an old corporate employee of this corporation they're trying to break into and they miss this guy entirely and instead they pick up on this lady who has never worked for that corporation ever in her life. However, she's been trying to all this time. Right. And so the new avenue now in road is all these like job applications and such which she's really good at because she's been trying to get a job for this company the whole time and they synergistically work together to both get in like, yeah, we can get you a job here but you need to make sure we're at the meeting and so on and so forth and attach that way. Um, it's it, it all depends on where the characters go. Like you can't – as much as you want to, you can't force them to do anything. Everybody knows that. They're – out of control 99% of the time. Right. And and the NPCs are just going to be there wherever they go. So, I, I mean, I guess this pushes into a question that uh, that we've got from our community, which is mm-hmm. um, if you do make elaborate notes, how often do your PCs latch on to NPCs that you have vague notes versus the ones you really suck time into? I know I have written – Extensive notes on certain characters, whether they be henchmen of a of of a boss who's just like lingering around an area waiting for them, mm-hmm. or if it's you know uh, if it's a specific, I, I I guess I call them like hero assists, where it's somebody who's there looking for the heroes because they need to get them information that's important. Right, right, you know, right. I'll write those things up, and then my players will inevitably go after the little boy in the pub who was a random NPC that I created because he's there because his house got destroyed. Oh, he's an adorable little urchin. Let's take him home with us. Exactly yeah. those kind of moments. So I, I, I definitely think there is a a certain point where you stare at your notes and you're you're almost crying, but at the same time, it your players are part of that story. Right, right. The nice thing about that is that that carries over. Right, all of those notes aren't 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 going to be used in that game session, but that doesn't mean that you can't use those any other time. Right. Use that character or use all that stuff from that character for a different character. You just keep that in your toolbox and you have that now. Yeah, there's there's been a number of times even already in our in our uh, D&D campaign right. where uh, you guys like I, I I spent, you know, hours writing up something that you guys just either never made it to or mm-hmm. you decided to just go a different way and then four game sessions later I'm finding myself going, "Oh, thank God I spent hours writing this up." Three months ago, like <laughs> right, because you can because now I can just re- relax. Like right, you've already got it down. I can. Does I anyone can know miniatures a blood or mage? play video games? Oh my god, I, I wrote about a blood mage. <laughs> right, 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 right. Exactly, exactly. So, I mean, I guess that asks the question: like, how much do you write up? Like, what is what is a good minimum to write up about an NPC? You know who um, who has an IMDb listing, aka they got a line in the story, or they have a moment in the story that's important. You know that's the way I'm kind of looking at this: is what do we write as a minimum to make sure that we have? And I think, uh, like, is a stat block too much, or should you even do that? I've never written a stat block for an NPC in my life. Uh, that that's astounded me when you said that to me the first time. But mm-hmm. as you talked about it, it made more sense. You, if you know the system well enough, and that's an advantage that I have in, in most games that we're playing, uh, not every GM is going to be like that. You don't need to know any of that stuff. You can off the top of your head, OK, I know what a typical commoner fights like. I know what the – how many hit points an eighth level fighter goblin is going to have. If things hit the fan – I don't have to worry about any of that. I could do it off the top of my head. Most cases, you just like I said before, you, you the motivation of the character, what it looks like to the outside, and what's really going on in the inside. That's really all you need for any NPC. So you're t- so when we we talk about this. We're saying what is the description, or yeah. or what are the descriptive 
I, I guess you could say trope or figures that the players can see. Mm -hmm. What is that character's motivation? Why are they there? Why are they doing anything that they're doing? So that when the players interact with them, it's a very quick response. Uh, and then just have some inherent stats, either know them by rote or just keep a sheet, like keep a quick sheet to the side that has like, oh, this is a commoner stats. There you go. So that if somebody says, I'm going to go stab this guy, you're like, yeah, it happened. Yeah. Or, oh, he made an amazing role. Maybe it didn't. Uh, for for our tabletop game, uh, I've been I've been writing just immense amounts of NPCs because you guys have been spending a lot of time in major cities, right? And uh, in those cities, then there are organizations you guys have been trying to uh, interact with the nobility. You've been trying to interact with the mages guild and the fighters guild and such like that. And these are all people that I need to come up with now. And of course, every every count. Uh, you know, for, for this nobility you guys uh, have interacted with, uh, have a council of nine advisors. So that's like nine more NPCs that I've got to come up with. Right. So, and then I didn't know which of the three or four major cities you guys were going to settle in with. So that's, you know, do the math on that one. It's and a lot. Each guild I've come up with like four, like a leader and then like four interesting people. You know, the understanding the guilds are much bigger, but either these are like the four people you'd run into, you know, that kind of give a face to the guild. So, OK. OK. So let me ask you this. OK. Then. Sure, sure, sure. Um, and I literally was looking at the next question. And it, it kicked off in my head the one thing you had talked about. Mm -hmm. When you're – when we're talking about the important factors that keep NPCs from becoming stale, mm -hmm. like obviously if you're making hundreds, there's going to be tons of those um, that are stale cliches. Opposed to like something memorable or something interesting mm -hmm. uh, in the world. One of the things you did I thought was really cool and I didn't notice it. But after you've talked about it with me, I thought it was absolutely brilliant, a, a simple way of doing it. So kind of explain what you did for the two NPCs uh, that we that we just met coming in uh, to one of our campaigns. They they showed up out of the rain is the way I'll put it. Sure, sure. Um, well, first I want to start by crediting where I got this idea from. OK. Always um, uh, so oh, good. The uh, there's a really great uh, video series on Geek and Sundry's uh, YouTube channel. Okay, uh, called uh, DM Tips. Okay, uh, it was originally started actually by Matthew Mercer, um, or at least he was hosting it. I don't know who created the oh, show. The critical but, role guy. Uh, but he he started it off, and he only did about ten episodes or so before handing it off to Satine Phoenix. Okay, and uh, Satine is absolutely wonderful, and uh, brings a lot of really great guests on the show to talk about various aspects of uh, of storytelling and such like that. I would actually credit that uh, that. Video actually is a uh, – the video series is a major inspiration for kind of what got us into the studio. Right. Because uh, watching things like that was made me think, why, why, are, why are we doing this? Like we got a lot of experience to share. We why could, are we doing this? That's a whole show. You know that. Right, right, right. So uh, one episode was about doing interesting NPCs and her guest on that show was uh, Talis and Jaffe of Critical Role fame. Right. Um, he described a uh, technique he said using the seven dwarves. Actually, right. as archetypes, and so you basically just choose a, uh, a like a high, a medium, or a low register, and then one of the seven dwarves. And so you might have a high, sleepy character who kind of talks up in a nasally voice, <laughs> like this is just done with the world and just uh, just kind of wants to get through things. Or you might have like a low, grumpy, who's just like, yeah, hey, what do you want? Oh yeah, okay, sure. I got one of those. All right, here's here's your here's your gauntlets. What else? Okay, you know, um, and so uh, I started kind of incorporating that into my NPC generation. And so as I was putting this delegation together, um, the mayor, her husband, the uh, leader of the fishing guild, uh, and the captain of the guard, essentially for this little village, he was the the town sheriff because they only needed one lawman, right? Um. Came into town to hire you guys to take care of a problem for right. them. And uh, when they got there, the mayor was doing the majority of the talking. Her husband was more or less standing at her shoulder, giving her support and nodding as appropriate and, you know, lending to her authority. Right. But the other two, uh, the sheriff was essentially uh, sneezing and blowing his nose the whole time. I do remember and just, that. He just looked bedraggled and just like he had – probably inhaled three pounds of dust on the trail on the way there right. um and the uh the cap or the 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 uh guy from the anglers guild walked over to the corner sat down put his head down and fell asleep yeah i thought it was perfect 
And they were like, oh, wow, these guys are exhausted. Like, this is not a low-level thing. Like, they, they trekked three days on foot out of the highlands to come here to hire us to handle their problem. Right. And it had all that weight because <sighs> – Sure, you had your your quest giver NPC who was mm-hmm. like, oh, there's a troll. You must come and help us with it. But these other two NPCs who really honestly didn't have a lot of dialogue. One didn't have any. One didn't have any. The the ang- the, the the captain of the Anglers Guild literally came in, sat in the corner, and fell asleep. But the fact that he was there and the fact that the party got to see like, oh, these guys are exhausted. Yeah, we came up with our own story of what had happened. Exactly. Like, you, you didn't even think about it. We were thinking, wow, this this A must have been a terrible journey. Secondly, there was a lot of rain. Mm-hmm. You know, as far as we were concerned, we were like, wow, may, maybe we're going to have to be concerned about some survival here. And all of that came from that simple thing where you basically made one I had sleepy. S- sneezy and sleepy. Yeah. And yeah. hearing you talk about it after made me laugh. But as a storyteller, that's brilliant. Mm-hmm. That's that's a simple way to solve what a character is and have what how they're going to react and move through situations. I think it's beautiful. The other thing that I really like too, if you're having trouble with coming up with NPCs, or if you have a mass amount of them to come up with, like right. like I was just describing, I oh, do, yeah, where yeah. we've got like oh gee, I've got four cities worth of you know worth of important people to make. Right. Um, uh, you know, you only want to you want to narrow it down to like the the most major people. But uh, I uh, I pulled up the uh, the fifth edition DM's guide. Uh, for um, dr- for Dungeons and Dragons, and in the DM's guide, there's a whole section on building NPCs, and one of the things that's in there is an like an, a random attributes list. And I don't mean attributes like strength, con, dex. I mean like this guy has a scar. This guy talks with a lisp. Uh, this woman is uh, exceptionally tall. Characterizations. Exactly. Okay. Characterizations, and so just they're little things to make. Make them stand out from random Bob. Yeah. You know. I know that, Chris, when you were doing Shadowrun, one of the neat things that even as players you had us do, but I thought was neat about all of your NPCs, was you gave them quirks, something unique about them. Um, like uh, – and in, in we were talking yesterday. You had brought up the fact that like one's an otaku. Like – that that's not necessary for game, but it does give a flavor to the character, right? People at face value, right? So right. The, the one I was talking about specifically, he's a he's a contact for a rigger. A rigger is like a guy who uh, controls a bunch of vehicles in Shadowrun, right? Uh, so he needs like a mechanic or you know a computer guy, and this guy is like right out of uh, essentially an anime playbook, right? He builds little Gundam robots and Akira motorcycles, and right. He's all into anime and manga and all that other stuff. So everything that this Rigger guy brings to him as far as uh, shadow running and illegal underground operations and whatnot. It's just really cool to this character, and he kind of starts to idolize him and look up to him. And of course, the PCs completely latched onto this guy, and it became a much bigger story element to the point where after this character, the NPC had been kidnapped and murdered. They actually found a way to rescue him and like repurpose his brain in this submarine and like they they would not let this character go. Oh, wow. um, Never letting them die. Yeah, yeah. Um, one thing I, that your conversation made me think of. So many many years ago, I was running a D and D game and I had a player that was a thief, and they would work the crowd. A and thief they would, and they D and D. I know it was ludicrous. Wait, wait, wait. Was this old enough for them to be called an assassin? No, this was this or was old enough to be called a thief. Free rogue. <laughs> Oh yeah! So, wow. Okay. Uh, that, so second edition out. skills and powers, I think. Second okay. way back. Uh, yes. To second edition. Yes. Nineteen eighty and something. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so she would work the crowd, and she would steal things, and I would roll dice. And now I I don't take shortcuts as a GM, right? So to me, I have to logically decide, like, okay, if she's robbing this guy. What could this guy reasonably have? Right. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that was very processor intensive and I didn't <laughs> like it, right? Because it, it would literally happen five times during the game. Yep, yeah. yep, yep, so what yep. I decided to do instead of that was just roll on the random minor treasure table, mm-hmm. right? And whatever is on that mi- random minor treasure table, that's what this guy has in his pocket. Then, based on that, we determine what's going on with that NPC. Okay. So there was an instance where uh, she lifted a vial of poison, 
Like, why does this guy have a vial of poison? Oh, is he in the okay. thieves' guild? So is suddenly, he trying to assassinate someone? So suddenly your your character attribute is is no longer random guy. It's random guy who happens to have poison. Exactly. Right. Which, exactly. Guy, and now they're sorry, trying guy to decide, who would logically have poison. Right. Do they blackmail him? Like, we know you have this. Right. Do they use him right. as a contact to get into the thieves' that guild? That is brilliant. So that's, and so now that's a nice little shortcut now. If you don't know what an NPC is mm-hmm. in a D&D game, roll around man, random uh, man – Random minor treasure table and now the guy has like a scroll of cure light wounds but he's not any sort of caster. Why does he have that? Right, Where right. did it come from? Who is he healing? Right. Why does he need right. this? I like, think that's a great like – And that, it turns out maybe, maybe he's keeping uh, – maybe he's keeping like a necromancer in his house before the guard can find him. He's bringing the scroll back to heal him. You know, you've got all this stuff now going underground that the characters can latch on to if they oh, want. Oh, my goodness. I think that's great. So we've we've kind of – Framed up what it is. We framed up how to make them. We gave us tools. How the hell do we keep track of this shit? Oh God! I mean, I- I've tried different methods. I'm I don't terrib- know, and I just want to cry now. <laughs> Tell me about <laughs> it. There's too many NPCs, guys. <laughs> so I've always kept spreadsheets of my characters and their names because that's and just basic stuff because that's the easiest way for me to keep track of like the mass of NPCs. And obviously, you know, there's ways for each story. I've started to now take notes per. Uh, episode and so that I have handwritten uh, pieces for each story or or at least digital notes that I'm working on. Uh, pardon our, uh, our engineer's dying over here. <laughs> Hopefully. You're going to be okay over there? You're gonna Don't be good? go, Kate. Right. You're too young. Yes. It's allergies. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm trying to like keep it in, but I think it just like exploded something. I don't know. <laughs> so as long as you don't lose any limbs, we're doing okay. So She, has, she has chosen the sneezy characterization. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. I'm pro. <laughs> All right. So, but what I'm uh, so I guess what I'm getting at is beyond the day, the episode to episode, or 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 you know game night to game night. What do we do to make it functional for us as storytellers to try and keep going? Now I've got my idea, but I want to hear what you guys have as well. So normally I just keep it nebulous. Unless the players engage in it, I don't ever write anything down. Right. The minute something comes out of someone's mouth, that goes on a piece of paper. Like, uh, you know, they like, oh, by the way, what's your name? And then he says his name. Boom. I have to write that down now because they're going to remember it and they're going to ask about that guy down the road. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. If she mentions that her father also fought in the same battle that this player character's father fought in, that goes down on the sheet. Right. Because now they have that link going back to them. Right. Uh, until then, everything is nebulous and I don't write any of it down because it's subject to change without notice. Okay. Okay. I go a little bit deeper. Um, I have uh, uh, extensive Evernote, uh, Evernote, Evernote.com. It's just an online note-keeping thing. Right. Um, and so I've got uh, some really extensive notebooks on that particular program. And that way it's online for me. It's portable for me. Uh, but honestly, at first, most of my NPCs are just a name, a gender, and a race. Right. Uh, race is important just because I'm, I, we're playing Elder Scrolls and there's like nine different races. Right. Um, so – uh, it, that also kind of gives me a, a real a cue there. And then uh, maybe just a note or two on what their particular demeanor is. It might be one of the seven dwarves or if I've come up with something a little alternate, you know, just a, a little something else. Um, like, for instance, the, uh, uh, the, the, the twin, the twins the in, twins, the, uh, yeah, yes. uh, in the, the, the Mages Guild uh, were literally invented just because I was randomizing my NPCs. I've got a spreadsheet – that oh, yeah, that's generates about random that. race, random gender for me. Uh, and it will throw and if a seven. If you pay $100 to our Patreon, you'll get it. <laughs> it will It will also throw one of the seven dwarves in there. Or, or if you know even intermediate Excel, you can write it yourself. Probably. It's, it's really nothing special. Um, so if I need that cue, it, it draws one of the seven dwarves randomly for me as well. Well, that's nice. Um, I mean, and, that definitely and, makes it easy. And it'll give me high, medium, low if I need that re- – if, if I need the register as well. Right. Um, but uh, all that one was was uh, I had two male high elves – Come up at the same time when I was coming up for uh, with people in the Mages Guild, and I was like, "Oh, two male high elves. Oh, they got to be brothers. Yeah. Oh, okay. wait, what if they were twins? That would be funny. Yep. And th- that fun, interesting characters were born literally from just having two of the same race right next to each other on a random list. Right. Um. But other than that, though, my lists are pr- that. That's pretty much it. Right. But then, yeah, it kind of goes into what Chris was saying. If uh, if if something important comes out of that, then that goes down in 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 Evernote for me. If uh, you know, suddenly somebody says, "Well, uh, you know, 
you know, this, this character is now involved with this other plot or something like that. Now suddenly that goes down. Right. Yeah. I think for me, like I, I haven't gotten a chance to do it yet because I haven't gotten back to my campaigns in a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, I started using Scrivener for doing writing and it's got a lot of neat tools in it. And I've seen a couple of good videos of where people are using it for storytelling yeah, and, and, in the things. GMing because you can have a lot of extensive – you can have images in there. You can have links. So it's it's effectively like a really, I guess, crafty HTML system. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the basics of it, it's it's story. And you can basic – you can write out your episodes as they happen and then link back to characters and very quickly edit into those character sheets – what knowledge they might have, what they might have said or what another character might have said to them. So I'm going to probably try and use that a bit more over the course of the next year as as things get back in the swing of mm-hmm. – uh, as they should um, and see how that works out. And I'll, I'll probably end up – we might actually do another uh, story, uh, another one of these podcasts on just the tools. Oh, yeah. And talking about what, what's good, what the pros and cons and things mm-hmm. like that are for them. Yeah, we had, a, we had a question. I think it was last week too about uh, t- leveraging technology. Yeah, uh, and I, th- I think that's a, I think that probably warrants a lot more discussion. So we we may want to yeah. note that for a future episode. Yeah, I, I and definitely. For do. those of you listening at home, this is uh, our, this is our process, and so you may want to tune in for that future episode. Yeah, sometimes we just suddenly keep, keep, come keep, up with ideas. Keep an, keep an eye on that. Google Docs for the win. Right yes, it, that is actually I I like Google Docs. I like using. The spreadsheets. I like uh, Google Docs because you can comment on the side. Mm-hmm. So if you're mm-hmm. live working on something, you can just highlight and make a quick comment even for yourself yep. yeah. that doesn't yeah, sit within the body of the document. And then you can also get that whole outline format. So you can – if as long as you're using the headers and everything, you can quickly flip through whatever you need to. So I, th- I think it's pretty powerful for free. You know, mm-hmm. so we we've come to that section, the one that makes us talk for the probably the longest here, and is going to be the ch- most challenging, I would say. And that is, what is your favorite? It's like, what is your favorite? Now, I have favorites of my own, and I have favorites that I have known of for other people, and I I am going to come back to the one that I want you to tell the story again, Chris, because I need our listeners to hear about this. So. Chris, I was not in this game. Keep in this mind. But I know this NPC better than I know the characters that are in that game for Chris. And uh, it, it, it's a shopkeeper. But mm-hmm. it is more than just a shopkeeper. Keeper. So, OK. So the idea was this was a white wolf game. So you had vampires and mages and werewolves and fairies and ghosts and all these other things sort of running together and doing stuff. And there were a lot of mystical, magical objects that they were looking for or whatnot. And so I needed a source for that as well as an expert on that material and I decided to make a magic shop. It was called uh, Geiger's Occult Emporium. Uh, but the way that the campaign spread out, they we would play New York. We would play Chicago by night. We would play local Detroit stuff. There would be you know, uh, old time, new time sort of all over the board. So I decided to make this shop essentially dimensionally omnipresent. It was in every major city, in every major timeline, uh, minus mid-80s Beirut because no one wants to live there. Um, <laughs> Even <and> greater demons. <laughs> that was explained in the fact that this – in the basement of this occult shop was essentially an ancient one, like a Cthulian deity, a yogg Sothoth type entity. And this shop sort of lived on the back of this creature. So it was kind of like Needful Things meets Call of Cthulhu with the part of the devil played by a death mage <laughs> and he you know would invite people in and they would like oh i i needed this infinity gauntlet and like well i don't have an infinity gauntlet however i do have this <laughs> And of course, they probably shouldn't end up taking that, but they do, and you know how that goes. But uh, yeah, hilarity is, ensues. But whenever they needed that character to turn up, there right. he was right. H.R. Mobius, the Black Avatar of Death. Yeah, he, I, he left the back part off for most people. <laughs> but I, I loved that you took just a simple thing you needed to solve a simple problem. I needed them to be able to go to get to a merchant, and it's like do. Do I go and make a whole franchise? Like, do how do I make this work? And you you knitted it all together in this beautiful story that had motivation and drive, and then the it became its own adventure. Yeah, and they the players actually stuck onto that so much that they they altered the life path of that NPC, and essentially there was a whole story arc start to finish around that whole character. Yeah, I mean, I, I've heard a story, and I, I can't, I probably will never tell it well enough about uh, one of our listeners and another one. Uh, were involved in a campaign uh, where there was a little girl in a well that they had to save. Mm-hmm. Who and she was effectively a nobody, 
But she somehow was in this well and being attacked and one of the characters just jumped down there and saved her. Well, of course, they save her, take her back to the town and that they, you think that's going to be the end of it. Oh, no, 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 no. They then got money to get her to be able to go to like mage college. Oh, jeez. And like lifted her up and turned her into this whole other thing that they carried through the campaign. And kept checking on her and doing other things to make sure she was doing all right because she had lost her family and all these other things. And I'm just – all I can think of is this is what our players do to us. They take something simple and make it make it so much more. Um, I know for myself that uh, my – an NPC that I've loved was something that my players had driven into and that's uh, from my 7C game, Padre Inguis. And he was a simple character. He was just a priest. And uh, I had written like two lines saying that he he basically was a uh, – he was uh, concerned about the Inquisition finding out uh, something about him. And uh, because of that, they could use that against him to basically have him out the players. And that was pretty much it. But in literally his opening scene, one of the players decided to use him – to defend themselves from uh, the Inquisition and uh, rolled a seduction roll. And it was the one thing that I'd written down about him was that he was easily seduced. Mm -hmm. And he went from being this nobody character to being this important, like almost hero to her and trying to save her and the rest of the group because obviously she was attached to them because he was infatuated with her. Mm -hmm. And now Padre is in all kinds of stories that I have now. I, I bring him back every once in a while just for the fun of it. Oh, Padre and Grace. Yep, yep. Uh, so I, I had to give this one a little bit of thought myself. Okay. Um, and I know uh, I, I talked about Lyra and Cassia Fortunatus. I do the, love them. They're the, wonderful. The lucky ladies. Uh, they're, they're a couple sisters that have uh, part, of the, part of the Fighters Guild in my current game. And I was going to say that those are my two favorites. Oh. Uh, but I think thinking back on it, I'm going to go all the way back to like my early 20s here. Um, a game that I ran in my own homebrew session, uh, my own homebrew uh, D and D world, and this okay. is when we were playing Dragonlance Fifth Age. Oh wow! Yeah, I know that's an archaic system right there. Go ahead and Google that one, folks. Yeah, because uh, it's uh, a painful system. Yeah, most of you. Well, I don't know. It was. Uh, I'm not going to get into it. Yeah, I'm we'll, not gonna get, but I liked it. I okay. liked it. We'll come back to All that right, one. We'll, we'll, come we'll back. talk about Fifth All Age. Right. All right. But I liked it. Um, but uh, so one of our one of our characters. Um, in in character creation, you would draw cards because it was a card based system rather okay. than a dice based system. Okay. And in character creation, drew a specific card that basically said that his character had some sort of weird quirk, and so we figured out what that quirk was off of a random table. That quirk happened to be a mistaken identity. Oh. There was another character out there that bore his likeness at least close enough that. He was constantly mistaken for Ulrich the Righteous. Oh, Lord. And Ulrich was just out there doing what adventurers do. But the problem was is that anywhere that uh, um, Jannar, the, 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 the PC, right. went uh, would sometimes have a reputation already preceding him. Right. Even if that were the first time he were there. And sometimes it was, oh, thank the gods you're here. Our savior has come again. Please, you know, <laughs> you fixed all of our problems last time by slaying that dragon. Uh, so, you know, can since that was a simple task for you, can you do this again? And sometimes uh, he w went in. They wanted to get an audience with the king uh, in this one kingdom. And they were like, hey, buddy, you know, there's just this simple thing. We just need basically need to ask the crown for permission to do this and we'll be right out of your hair. And the king latched right onto him and was like, you, I thought I told you to leave my kingdom and never return, you know, and was just out of his throne railing at him before he realized, you know, the mistake. Nice. Um, there actually was later on in that campaign, they actually ended up finding Ulrich. And Ulrich was actually just as pissed at Jannar because, I mean, it works both ways. Yeah. So Jannar was showing up in – or Ulrich was showing up in places and it was like already found out all the stuff that Jannar had already done. Right. That started getting tacked onto his tab. So Nice. Nice. I like that. I would have never thought I like that design. That's it was really a, cool. It was, a, it was a fun little 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 quirk to throw in to complicate things. So. OK. All right. So I have, I have two essentially, both from Shadowrun, one of which was a software package that we gave to <laughs> a computer decker uh, who was – they were doing a run. 
And you know how sometimes Deckers get nosy and they like, while I'm here and doing this thing I'm supposed to, let me also see if there's anything else valuable I can take. Right. And so she did. And so I gave her this sort of – this is well before uh, Battlestar Galactic was a thing. But she essentially had this character that was loaded on her cyber deck that only she could see through her cyber eyes. So it would be like a room full of people like we're talking right now except there would be a fifth person in the room that only she could see. And this person would give her advice and help her out of trouble. And it was – and this thing had an IQ of 700. So it was like a hologram that she could only see. It wasn't a hologram though because she she sees you with her eyes just like – Right, right. Okay, all right. It might as well have been flesh and blood. Right. right? She's just on, on his augmented reality. Exactly. There we go. Exactly. Okay. Right. Yeah. And and so I'm up what you're putting down. it was making her rich, and it was getting her to upgrade her computer, which which is what she was trying to do in the first place. But it wasn't trying to help her. It was becoming smarter because it was running on her computer, and oh. then everything that it did for them was beneficial to it. In addition to being beneficial for them. And they didn't get that. And at the very end of the story arc, they were just minions. They turned out to be minions for this thing. And they were they were doing things they had no idea why. <laughs> it was working out great for them. But they were just tools for this AI that was running the show essentially. Yeah. Uh, the other one was actually an NPC sidekick to another character in a Shadowrun game. So there was a character called Boris. He was an escaped Russian gymnast physical adept. OK. Uh, and uh, at some point he died in the course of the game. But he had a pet feathered serpent about the size of a house cat. And we took it and the team adopted it and raised it. And over the 10 years of gaming that followed, by the time it was done – so the guy's name was Boris. And he called his uh, feathered serpent Yeltsin. Uh, <laughs> but Marty wanted to call it uh, Boris Jr. So we ended up calling it Boris Yeltsin Jr. And it talked in Shadowrun slang in a Russian accent with a tiny child voice. Oh, my God. Uh, but by the time the game campaign was over, at, outside of our headquarters, we had a full-size feathered serpent essentially living in this sort of tree fort above our warehouse. <laughs> and it was phenomenal. We had this just this dragon that hung out with us that we'd raised for 10 years. Is it is it is it bad that I think the most incredible thing about the story is the fact that you kept a gaming group together for ten years? Yes, that yeah. is that is impressive. <laughs> yep. I, I do think we should eventually talk about game lengths and, and story lengths yeah. and how yeah. that would be yeah. ongoing campaigns. It's absolutely, absolutely. so I think we should get to some community questions. Though. I think we should right. too. I we've got we definitely should. two or three here. So uh, we've got one here from the Mad Elf. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you see as some benefits or detractions of narrating from the first and third perspective, uh, person perspectives? Now, that's kind of interesting because I don't even notice that I do it. Mm-hmm. But I, I, as I was reading over the question, I was like, do I do it in the first or do I only do it in the third? And I think there are – it depends on the the game yeah. really and what you're yeah. doing. Like 7C, I'll do a lot of things in third person uh, just because it's easy to talk about a scene in that way. Um, yes. But yes. there's there's a number of times when you're talking about going into a dungeon or something like that where a lot of it comes off in the very – in a very first person perspective. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I default to second. I like so yeah. you go in, you see right. this, right? There is that, and so so I don't give the players any information that they wouldn't normally have. Right. I never do a cutaway scene, right? Like meanwhile, in the dungeon across from you, this thing is happening. I don't do that because they don't know that, right? Right. right. That that has to come to them logically. So it's always it's always the when when you enter the room, it smells like such and such. There you see this. Uh, this is happening. Uh, maybe in the past, based on what you can tell, this once happened there, but you don't know that kind of thing. Right. I uh, I, I think I I definitely alternate between the two as well. Mm-hmm. Um, it really more. I, I think the the trigger for it is: Am I addressing a player or am I addressing the group? Right. If I'm addressing a player, I'll describe what you see. You see this. You smell this. Something or another happens and you notice that happening. Right. Um, whereas if I'm just kind of addressing the table as a whole, something that's happening globally to the room, OK, this is going on. That's going on. Thalian sees this. Theodane sees this. And while that's all going on, Lyrilith right. senses this. So I think that's where this kind of question goes to is mm-hmm. what are the benefits or detractions? I think the benefits are that if you're working in a third person or a second person, you're only showing them what they can see. You're only talking about the physical thing. So it makes it very easy for the players to latch on. But that's a global mm-hmm. C. And then you have to go to that first person to be able to tell an individual what they're getting differently. And I think being able to talk in those two tones 
separately to your players I think is a, is something you have to be careful of because obviously you have those players who just sit at your table and sometimes don't listen mm-hmm. and they miss the second player you know they and they only hear what you're telling the one person right, or they're right. only listening for what they're listening for and I think that's where some of the the detraction can come from is because you can lose people uh, at a table uh, due to distraction where they miss some of that. They don't pay attention unless you're talking specifically to them. In yeah. the first person, yeah. you're yeah. giving them that. Yeah. So, uh, I think the big the big advantage of sec- using second-person narration too is you're speaking directly to that person's uh, imagination. Right. So when I say you see the sunset through the window so you know you're facing west and it's lighting the sky golden orange and you can you can just see the faint clouds wisping past and a couple birds fly by and you notice those birds are seagulls right. and you you can smell the salt on the air mm-hmm. n- telling you you're near the sea you know all of that right there i'm speaking to you and the right. moment the moment that word you comes out Mm-hmm. There's, there, I think, I think there's something in your brain that just kind of goes, oh, this is, this is me, right? I, I have to internalize this, right? It's easy to start pulling those images in your head, exactly. of, of what you're, what you're getting as far as a, mm-hmm. a full description. That's, I, I agree with that. I agree. So, um, all right, uh, let's, we want to move on to the next one here. Sure. Uh, okay. Do you have a – this is a, from, from Techno Lich. Thank you so much for submitting this uh, off our Discord. Do you have a preferred length of story arc, uh, number of sessions, or is it unique to each arc? Honestly, I think it's unique. There, I mean there's something to be said for one shots. Mm-hmm. Don't get me wrong. Sure. And there's something to be said of trying to find a beat to move your story through. Mm-hmm. But I, I really find that like – at least in in seven C terms, I use the term I use acts, and I use scenes. So mm-hmm. there's so many scenes in an act. So for me, I I do it based upon when you're done with the scene, I move on to the next scene, and then we eventually finish an act, and you feel like something has been completed within that act. So that's kind of how I do the heartbeats, but that doesn't tell me how many sessions there's going to be. Right. I I used to write things a little closer to that, a little more cinematically. Mm -hmm. Uh, But what I found was that my players were largely uh, derailing my my scenes. Right. And that was a real problem for me, Uh, at least how I write and how I feel comfortable storytelling. Um, So what I've decided to do essentially is make uh, set pieces – uh, almost like an obstacle course or, you know, like a playground, uh, kind of, I guess, a sandbox environment is, is maybe what it would be referred right, right. to. Okay. Uh, but there are, there are things in the world that are intractable, essentially. Right. You know, there are plots that are happening. Right. And if you guys say, well, we're going to go to location A, well, location A has a plot that is happening. And so I know immediately what I'm going to present to you when your characters get there. If you don't get there, then – then, you know, that's the sound what goes on. But that also makes it a very player driven story. So, uh, that kind of opens up the end of like, well, I don't know. I mean, how many, how many game sessions is it going to take you? Okay. You know, well, it's I, com- comfortable as far as far as we're ro- comfortable running, I suppose. Yeah. But you, okay. Chris? For me, typically when I'm, uh, envisioning a game that comes in at the very beginning, like I don't decide on the number of sessions because that completely determines, uh, is determined by, <coughs> how the players do, right? If they are plot chasing go-getters, they could jump through 10 sessions worth of plot in five sessions. Right. Mm-hmm. Or they could never get to any of it. Right. Right. That's right. just how they operate. Uh, but typically I have a meta arc. So this is a thing that's going to happen. There is a war that they're trying to avert between these two big nations or companies or whatever. And there's a couple of key elements, people that are caught in the middle, and that will determine whether or not the war happens. So that's the big meta arc. And then say say act one is finding out what's happening and right. getting one of these key players involved. Act two is getting the second key player involved, the fate of the first one, and picking sides. And then act three is essentially uh, trying to act on whichever side they have chosen and either backing one or the other or, or new, you know, acting as a neutral party or starting the war themselves, whatever they mm-hmm. end up doing, right? And that could be, like I said, depending on how involved they are in the story, they could, you know, be on top of that and it could hammer out session after session after session. Look at this. We got this stuff done again and again and again. Or they could spend the entire campaign just trying to keep one of those two NPCs alive. 
Right. Or they could and find a little girl on a well and exactly. squirt it through mages. Exactly. exactly. Yep. And that's yep. and that's and that's fine with me. Uh, I will try to find story beats if if they're not interested in the in the war aversion campaign and they've got some other thing like oh there is there you know there was let's say an adventure where there was a red plague that happened in a town and now they're out there trying to like stop the spread of this disease across the country that's the new campaign right uh, give me a saturday i'll figure it out and that's that's the direction now. yep so i think i think the overarching answer here is as long as it takes yep. right right yep. i mean have an idea yeah of, if it's, of, if of it's your not story. a one shot it's, as it's long done as it's, when it's done it's done when it's done yeah yeah yep. yep. all right so we have two questions here um that i'm pulling up from the discord uh that were posted actually just just recently yep. um uh, today so one's actually another one from techno lich and another one from mad elf uh and they're they're kind of a they kind of piggyback on each other pretty they nicely should here. they should uh the questions are uh from techno lich what are your thoughts on intentional use of tropes and cliches in a story? <laughs> and the Mad Elf asks, and what are your favorite tropes and cliches to use? Uh, I, I say that I think they are essential. I think tropes and cliches are essential and mm -hmm. more so after our discussion. I didn't think they were as, but as we talked about it, I, I definitely agree that, you know, you need that. You need the players who who know that when, you know, it's a dirty, dusty town with old buildings and suddenly riders come in with black hats and black coats, guns, you know, glistening at their hips. You know, these are the the moments that you know those are the bad guys coming into town. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. they might have – one or two of them might have some morals stuck in them somewhere but those are the bad guys. Yep. You need that trope to be able to help you. You need, you need the white shining paladin. To, you know, come breaking through a door frame so that you know that that's not a bad guy. You know, that this is an, this is an important point in the story, but you need to know who that guy is on visual and feel. And to do that, we need to engage tropes. It, it, it's entirely possible. You can, you can uh, hang a lampshade on the tropes. So you'd like, OK, everybody knows what this guy is. That's just how this stuff's going to work. You can, you can turn it on its head, right. upend the tropes, so on and so forth. Or you can just add depth, right? Maybe that – Paladin is actually a fallen paladin and the reason he's fallen is because whatever happened is why these bad guys exist and he's taken it upon himself to stop them because that's his redemption arc and they just straight up kill him in the first act and now the players have to decide whether to carry on this goal to redeem this guy that tried to protect them or so on and so forth, right? Uh, it, it, you can do any number of things with it. It's just a way to communicate to the players, right? The tropes are there to convey whatever you're trying to get across without just straight up saying, hey, that's the good guy. You should help him. Right. right. Uh, the the example I always use is the Star Trek uh, Darmok and Jalada Tanagra episode, right? Mm -hmm. Him by his arms wide, right? You're communicating essentially using little snippets of stories to tell other stories. Exactly. And whatever beats you can find that people latch onto, you know, you can tell that this is a sword because when, you, when they raise it over their head, it, it glows blue and it hums and vibrates with magical energy like everybody knows what a magic sword is. Everybody right. just knows. You don't have to tell them it's magical. You just explain how it looks and now it's a magic sword and now it becomes a plot point. Everybody wants it. Right. I think uh, tropes are just building blocks. Right. Tropes are yeah. Legos. Um, and so I, I have no shame in, in using them. Even cliches to a certain point are are, are just Legos. Like yeah. um, cliches are just tropes that get used a lot. Honestly, right. and they're just well used familiar tropes. It's just a bad name, a word for for like, you know, for saying it, if you would. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I think a, a lot of it depends on how you use them. Um, so, uh, like I would I would use a food analogy. Um, right. you know, everybody knows what a steak is. Everybody knows what potatoes are. Right. But like, if you season those potatoes with thyme and rosemary and roast them slowly, and your steak's cooked just right, medium rare, medium rare is just right. Everybody, one minute, one um, minute, exactly. <laughs> I believe you'd be overhandling it, Squirrely Dan. Um, I'll but you know, and again, seasoned with salt and pepper, and you know, the right type of steak sauce and stuff like that. You know, you're not surprising anybody with steak and potatoes. Right. Right. But my. God, do you love it when it hits your tongue, you know? Exactly. You know what so, you're eating. Exactly. You yeah. know exactly you know. what you're eating. You're not – nobody's subverting anything with a, yep. with a finely cooked steak and potatoes. But, right. But it's it's how it's cooked. It's how it's delivered. Right. And I, I think yeah. you can – I think you can say the opposite to that if someone says, I don't know, I'm going to take this salmon and turn it into yogurt. Mm-hmm. Like everybody knows like that's not going to work out the way you think it's going to work out because you're going so far. All right. Real quick because we're running really short yes. on time. Yes. So real, real quick. Favorite trope. Oh, favorite trope. Um, I'm gonna have to say the the sh the uh, 
the femme fatale. Okay. So, you know, the murderous femme fatale. Murderous so, femme fatale. Uh, chosen one. Chosen mm, one. Nice. Ooh, okay. Very good one. Okay. Uh, mine's going to be uh, mine's gonna be big and stoic uh, paired up with the small and scrappy. Okay. Oh, I like yes. that very much. All right. So uh, as we get our closing here, our next week topic is going to be villains, henchmen, and adversaries. Oh, my. Oh, my goodness. All yeah. right. Uh, so as you are uh, out there on the internet, don't forget you can find us on Twitter at ST underscore conclave. You can also find us on Instagram, also st underscore conclave. Uh, join us on Discord. Uh, submit some great uh, listener questions, just like all of our other fans have. Yep, and uh, our uh, intro music was "Beyond the Warriors" by Goo Frog. Our outro music, which you're listening to right now, is "Only Our Footprints in the Sand" by Midair Machine. Both of those can be found at freemusicarchive.org. Find us at Podcast Detroit, which is might be how you're listening to us right now at podcastdetroit.com or on Twitter at Podcast Detroit. And a big special shout out to our families, Vicky, Sean. Thank you so much for uh, putting up with us as we uh, we go through all this, and to our friends who've sat at our tables, as and, well uh, as our guest here, Chris. Thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Have a great night, everybody. Thanks.